Good morning, church family. Most of you probably know what hallelujah means, right? You know, it's a universal word, but it comes from the Hebrew. And so believers everywhere share that exact same word. It, it literally means to shine forth Yahweh, um, which we just translate as praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's what we're doing even this morning. And while it's a delight to be here each Sunday, it's especially special this Sunday because this Sunday, churches throughout the globe are not only worshiping with us, but most of them are celebrating the same event. Um, the passage that we'll be in today is from Luke chapter 19, if you want to work your way to it. Um, but most of those churches will either be in this passage in Luke or in one of the parallel passages in one of the other three Gospels. Um, it's the passage we know best as the triumphal entry as we celebrate Palm Sunday, the king's arrival into Jerusalem. You see, Israel has been awaiting the arrival of a king. The king who would come to remove Israel's repro reproach by conquering all her enemies. They have been awaiting the son of David, the heir who would sit on David's throne and restore the glory and honor of Israel. Well, the king has indeed arrived. The king, the son of David, has come. Now, we're going to walk through this passage. Luke 19, verses 28 through 40, a little bit differently than what we have in the past. We're going to go through these verses, the whole of them, three times. Now, that might worry some of you, because when we only do two verses, we might stay here for quite a while. And if we do it three times in a row, we might be here till Good Friday. I promise to get you out before then, okay? Um, we're going to look at them, at these verses from three different perspectives. One, Jesus as the long-expected king. Two, as, with Jesus as the not-so-expected king. And the third time through, we're going to look at Jesus as our beheld king. So if you're able, would you stand as I read um, from Luke chapter 19. I'm going to begin at verse 28. And when, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it. And bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went, untying the colt, I'm sorry, went and away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry 
out. Father, we ask that you show us wondrous things within your word, that you would show us just who you are. The wonderful works, the wonderful script that you have written. We ask that you would reveal to, to us ourselves what you had fashioned us to be and what we had become. And we ask that you show us our remedy, our King and our Savior, who has come in the name of the Lord. Make your word a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not sure when my family started watching the cartoon series Bluey. This Australian-based cartoon that revolves around a blue healer pup named Bluey and her family. With the average episode being a short seven minutes, the kids will often tag an episode onto the end of whatever else they might, have, might be watching. And so often enough, I find myself prey to the show's adorable wit, like I did the other night. And as the episode centered around a birthday party, a game called Pass the Parcel. Now, the gist of this game is there's a prize, and it's wrapped up in multiple layers, um, with each layer um, having in it wrapped a lesser gift. The kids, they sit around in a circle, and the, the parcel is passed as music plays. And when the music stops, whichever kid has it, they unwrap it, and they receive that gift in the layer that they find, and then they continue passing it around until at the end, there's a single prize left. But this is not the way the game was initially intended to be played. Somewhere along the way, it was modified so that when the kids had their birthday parties, they had certain expectations. But then enters Lucky's dad. He's a golden retriever, I believe. And he wants to bring back the original game, how the game was intended from the beginning. Instead of a slew of lesser, uneventful gifts with each unfolding, Lucky's dad wrapped one big prize to be discovered only at the end of the game. The problem was, as the kids played, they had these expectations. And as they unwrapped, they were highly disappointed when they came up empty. In fact, most of them to the point that they melted down and left the game because they did not receive their smaller, lesser participatory prizes. No, there was only one big prize at the end, and it was only the pup who remained to the end who received it. Yet as time went on and birthdays came and went, the kids began to realize that the true version of the game was far better than any modified version they had experienced. Indeed, it was the only way to play the game. Rather than a bunch of trivial gifts for everyone, for every party, the excitement of that one big prize far exceeded and made all their disappointments more than worthwhile. Jesus is the big prize at the end of the game. The anticipated climax. He is more than enough for any single child. He is enough for all of us to share. The story God wrote, the way God had originally intended the script, far exceeds our best efforts at fictionalizing and modifying God's story. Like the way the kids were used to playing the game, Israel had certain expectations concerning this coming king, which takes us to our first passing of the parcel, as it were. Jesus, the long-expected king. Our passage begins with, And when he had said these things, without giving a long lesson on biblical interpretation, I'm just going to say context matters. 
We need to know what the, these things are that came before. Jesus had just finished sharing a parable about a nobleman who had went off into a far um, country to receive a kingdom and then return. And when he went, he left certain subjects in charge of his um, kingly affairs. Now, the thing is, the people did not want this nobleman to reign over them. In fact, they even set a delegation saying, we don't want this guy as king. One of his servants who had been left to take care of the king's affairs had squandered his responsibility, tying it up in a handkerchief. The servant's excuse, he saw his master as a severe man. The king had commended the faithful. But as for his enemies who did not want him to reign over them, he determines they should be slaughtered before him. Well, this is the type of king the Jews are expecting. They're looking forward to a conquering king who will crush their enemies under their foot. The problem is, the Jews saw or assumed that God's enemies and their enemies were the same. This idea stretches all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where the Lord promises to finally crush the serpent under the heel of the chosen one. For further context, if you were to turn back a page in Luke's gospel, you'd find the story of the blind beggar, the blind man calling out to Jesus, the son of David. The Lord had promised David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 to set one of David's sons on his throne, never to be removed. But due to each son's own sin, they successfully were removed until there was no one left on the throne. But the Lord had promised through his prophets that he would raise up the fallen booth of David, that there would come a son of David to sit on that throne. In fact, the passage of Zach, um, our passage quotes from the book of Zechariah. And Zechariah mentions and likens the house of David to God himself in chapter 12. Even the messenger of the Lord. Zechariah anticipates that the coming day, the coming king, when the true David arrives, the Lord will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Thus, Israel's anticipation of a conquering king. That's Israel's long-expected king. That's who they're looking for. They're waiting for this conquering king. And Jesus is a conquering king. But there's far more to the story than what meets the eye. We also, we get a glimpse of the king's authority. If we're looking at verses 29 and 30. Go into the village. Find a colt, a particular colt, and bring it to me. The king commands and it takes place. He tells his disciples, go, and they go. Earlier, Luke had recorded a story of Jesus' interaction um, regarding a centurion. The centurion had sent some of his friends to um, ask Jesus to heal the, servants, uh, the centurion's servant. And the centurion said, Jesus was on his way to go to the centurion's house. And the centurion sends word, no. There's no need for you to come. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Instead, simply say the word, and it will take place. You see, for I myself am a man under authority who has soldiers under my charge as well. I say it tell one to go, and he goes, and another come, and he comes, and to do this, and he does it. Simply say the word. Well, Jesus has that power. He says, go, and his disciples go. They obey. We also have a wise king. He knows exactly where this colt is to be found. Where they will find the colt, he wants brought to him. 
Furthermore, the king has the power to release this colt. He's ordered the disciples to untie the colt. Should the owners hassle you in any way, tell them the Lord needs it. That will surely quiet them, right? Who's going to question the king? And then we have an exalted king. In verse 35, the disciples throw their cloaks on the colt and set Jesus on it. To understand what's going on here, we actually would need to back up to um, 2 Kings with the account of Jehu when um, Elisha sends um, one of the sons of the sons of the prophets to anoint Jehu as king, and Jehu is tasked with the um, with destroying God's enemies and the whole house of Ahab. Well, when Jehu is anointed king, all the men around him, what they do is they take off their cloaks and they throw it on the, the bare steps and they set Jehu on it. Jehu is exalted in their sight as he's exalted as higher than they are. Well, the same thing's taking place here with Jesus upon the donkey. They're throwing their cloaks on it. They're setting Jesus up as king, exalting him higher than themselves. Um, likewise, the the crowd is spreading their garments on the road before him. So that this king, that neither this king nor the beast that he sits upon, his feet will touch the bare ground. Jesus is presented as noble indeed. And then finally, with our first passing through, this long expected king is praised, rightfully so. If you look at verses 37 and 38, the people praised Jesus as the powerful king who had come in the name of the Lord, who had performed mighty works. This king is none other than Yahweh's king. In fact, it could be argued with a close reading of Psalm 118, where that's quoted from, which Eli had read from, for us earlier, and from Zechariah, uh, which this passage points to, that Jesus, this coming king, is none other than the embodiment of Yahweh himself. This king must be praised. He doesn't answer to the religious, religious elite who call, him, call for him to rebuke the crowd. Indeed, if his disciples were to remain silent, creation itself would cry out and praise him. Indeed, the very stones. Well, like the children's party game, past the parcel, the people had come to expect history to play out according to their preconceived notions, distorted by their preferences, but they had left out some of the script. The story, like the game, had gotten modified somewhere along the way to the point where they anticipated something far less than what the original script had called for. But just as Lucky's dad insisted on playing the game according to the designer's original intent, so too Jesus' father insisted that though many would walk away disappointed in this king he was gifting them, for those who stuck around to the end, it would be worth it. Which takes us to our second passing of the parcel. Jesus, the not-so-expected king. You see, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. The anticipated king, the son of David. But he is going up as a merciful king. Remember the blind beggar who called out, son of David? Well, that's not the end of what he says. He cries out, son of David, have mercy on me. And our Lord does just that. Jesus is going up to trample God's enemies underfoot, to crush them but he's going to do so by crushing their hearts of stone, by dying for them on the cross. You see, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem specifically to die. In the previous chapter, Jesus had now announced for the third time he was doing just that. If you were to back up to um, halfway through um, chapter 18, where it talks about Jesus foretelling his death for the third time. It says, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked, shamefully treated, spat upon. After flogging him, they will kill him. But on the third day, he will rise. 
they, these things, it says, they were hidden from the disciples. They were blind to it. But this blind beggar along the road recognized Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. The king is indeed authoritative, but his command to go is not simply a command. The, this king is inviting his disciples into his work to participate. He's not the hard master some accused him of being. We recognize that this king is not... Is, is also wise, but he's not simply so because he is omniscient, although he is. His knowing where to find this particular cult is because he's the one penning the script. He has orchestrated history from beginning to end. The prophets wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They didn't craft the prophecies themselves. The Lord determ determined that it would take place in such a way, and in such a place it would. This donkey, this colt Jesus is to ride about is there because the Lord purposed it to be right there. Now, one commentator insisted that the only reason Jesus knew that this donkey would be there is because he had secretly prearranged it before his coming. Now, I want to be fair to this commentator. I'm not sure what he meant by that. If he meant that Jesus had secretly sent a couple of his disciples ahead to arrange this meeting, making sure the cult was where he wanted it, he's missed the point. But if what he means is that the Lord of the universe, who upholds every aspect of creation by the word of his power, if this Lord secretly prearranged this cult's existence and location according to his own divine counsel, providentially determined that the cult to, would be in this exact spot at his coming, then such accords with the God revealed in Scripture. The Lord has purposed this cult, not only to be there, but even to be tied and to be bound, yet to be set upon, yet to have served his God-given purpose. I'm going to pause for a moment because this is not part of the message, but I want you to know wherever you are in life, whatever may have you tied and bound and you have not yet lived out your God-given purpose. God has purposed you where you are for a time such as now. Yes. He has a better plan for you. The time for this cult to be released has come. This king has the power and authority to do just that yes. for all creation ultimately belongs to him but why release it says because the king has need of it now what could the king of the universe possibly have everything at his disposal and be in need psalm 50 verse 12 says this if i was hungry i would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Or if we look at Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it is not served by human hands as if he needed anything at all. For he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. What could Jesus, the Lord of the universe, be in need of? Well, every need is qualified by its purpose. What is it needed for? I love going to home improvement stores, and I can spend literally hours there. In fact, I often do so. You can ask my wife. And as I look around, there's all kinds of things I need if I want to do this or that. Now, you might push back a little bit and say, all right, Josh, you are confusing want with need. But I don't think those words are as juxtaposed as we might often think. They're, they're not as different. You see, I don't just want a good hammer. 
If I want to drive nails efficiently, I need a hammer. Sure, could I get by with a rock or some other hard material? Yes, but not if I want to accomplish my purpose. I need a hammer. Samuel might need some ear protection if he wants to preserve his hearing as he operates loud machinery. Just reminding you of this, Samuel. Um, the, the need is purpose-oriented. For what? To protect Samuel's hearing. It doesn't matter whether or not Samuel wants to protect his hearing. If Samuel is going to protect his hearing, he needs some earplugs. Need is always purpose-oriented. Jesus needs the cult. Not just, this, not just a cult, this particular cult. In order to fulfill the prophecy found in Zechariah 9, Behold, your king is coming to you, mounted on a donkey. The, a cult, the foal of a donkey. This is not simply a want of Jesus. Okay? Now, does this contradict Psalm 50 or Acts 17, where it says, The Lord is not in need? Not at all. The Lord doesn't need our participation or our agreement in His plan in order to fulfill His purposes. He invites us in. And should we fail to obediently participate, the very stones, it says, will take our place. But this idea of need goes even further. As sovereign, He has no need of what belongs to another. Unless such a sovereign has taken on a nature like yours and mine, a nature of need and dependence, humbling himself that much. And that's what our Lord has done. This king doesn't need the cult because he was tired and weary or needed a more comfortable ride. Jesus had already gone the bulk of the journey from Galilee all the way up to Bethany on foot. In fact, if you read closely, it's likely that he climbed the bulk of this 4,000 foot elevation already before he climbs on the donkey for the descent. This need is an act of humbling himself. How amazing is that? Now let's gaze upon this exalted king. He needs the cult because he's not like any king who has come before. This cult, it says, no one has ever yet sat upon. Oh, how I'd love to trace through each and every king of Israel and Judah that had come before to compare them to our Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you, as you read through your Bibles, you should always be looking at everybody like that. Because that's who they're ultimately compared to. Is this the coming one? Is this the coming one? Is this the coming one? Because it's anticipated. Well, we're just going to look at two. Well, really one. Another one sought to be. We're going to look at Solomon and his brother Adonijah. Adonijah was Solomon's older brother. And as his father David was nearing the end of his life, since he was next in line for the throne, Adonijah exalted himself as king. He appointed for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And he even gathered to himself the two most powerful men in the country, Joab and Abiathar. And he conferred with them. But Solomon is a completely different kind of king. Solomon, in a major sense, is a portrait of Jesus. Although imperfect, he is a portrait of the true son of David to come. He doesn't exalt himself as king. Instead, he is appointed king by none other than who? His father. Just as Jesus is appointed king by his father. Rather than on a horse, Solomon is seated upon his father's very own mule. Now, a mule is not used for war. He is a service animal. 
Jesus was seated on, upon a colt, the foal of a donkey, because he was coming in peace to serve, not in conquest to wage war. Luke even records earlier in his gospel that something even greater than Solomon is here. Once more, let's recognize how Jesus is praised. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But this Psalm 118 being quoted, it points out that this king is also, as Eli read for us, the stone that is rejected. Jesus is coming as a rejected king, a rejected king. But such didn't make him any less the king, did he? Did it? In fact, this rejected stone would be the chief cornerstone, the most significant stone of the entire structure, of which the Lord is building a house for himself to dwell among his people. That's the promise that he makes to David. I will take one of your sons and build for myself a house for my name. Throughout Israel's history, God has chosen rejected leaders. The leaders he had chosen had been rejected. Some of them, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, even King David was rejected. Why would Jesus, the ultimate deliverer of God's people, be any less rejected? Furthermore, this king who comes in the name of the Lord, Psalm 118 also associates with the festival sacrifice, which is to be bound, tied up to the altar. Jesus is not only the coming king, he is the coming sacrifice. Israel's king is about to be bound. The crowd is shouting his praise, but it is likely much of this crowd is going to desert Jesus and his hour of need when he is arrested. And others are going to be there as, or as he stands trial, shouting, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar, they'll say. Jesus' entrance was a humble one. The most humble of any king in history. Jesus enters the capital city, presenting himself as king. And politically, the king is supposed to be the highest exalted, the most dignified in all the land. His inaugural entry would have included an entourage of the most noble and wealthy, with his army going before and behind to keep the peasant crowd at bay. At a minimum, the king would ride in on the finest of steeds, robed in royal flair. No king's procession, procession would be on a colt with lowly peasants as his core entourage. Jesus comes fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy, but not simply the external details of Jesus riding in on a colt, but far more significantly the character of this particular king. Righteous, possessing salvation, and humble is he. No other king has humbled himself like our king Jesus has. This donkey, no other king has sat upon. Only Jesus has stooped down and condescended this low in order to lift up the lowly. Amen. Glancing back again to chapter 18, Jesus announced that all who exalt themselves will be humbled and everyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. But while Jesus came in the most humble manner possible, the religious leaders abhorred it. Teacher, they said, rebuke your disciples. It's not going to happen. No. Well, we have one final pass. One more layer to unwrap. As the pups realized Lucky's dad's version of pass the parcel far exceeded others' mediocre attempts to make the game better. I pray that the unwrapping, the unfolding of the text to its climactic gift 
the person and work of Jesus never grows old and unanticipated in our lives. Though we have heard and read through this dozens of times, I pray that we can read it with fresh eyes each and every time we look at it with the excitement of little children opening that gift, anticipating the final prize. Jesus' Father's version of redemption history far exceeds. And thus we begin our third passing of the parcel. Jesus, our beheld king. For this final pass, though, what I want us to consider is how we are a part of this story. You see, this is our king who is coming into Jerusalem, who is going up with his face set like flint, determined to crush yours and my greatest enemies, the serpent who constantly accuses us before God. The love of the world that constantly lures us away from God. And our very sin that constantly keeps you and I separated from God. Furthermore, as the son of David, Jesus is going up to prepare a place to fulfill the promise made to King David that one of his sons would indeed build a house for the Lord to dwell in. Jesus sends his disciples telling them, go into the village in front of you where you are entering and you will find a colt tied which no one has ever yet set. Untie it and bring it here. For the most part, you and I as believers, we are not sent in to exotic far off places. We are simply sent into the village that is before us. Sent to those who are nearby. That's where Jesus says, you will find the one that I seek. The one who is tied. Notice also the disciples don't have to look long. They find the cult immediately upon entering. You and I don't have to look hard to find those who are bound in their chains of sin. The Lord says, untie this beast of burden. This colt has yet to serve its purpose. Bring it here, prior to the king of glory taking his seat upon us, setting up a mobile throne, as it were. We were bound by a yoke of slavery. This colt had never yet carried glory. Indeed, other kings prefer powerful war horses to carry their fame. Why? Well, because such kings aren't impressive. They aren't mighty. They aren't beautiful in themselves. But our humble king has chosen the lowly. Does that offend you? Beloved, it shouldn't. Don't let it, for your king is lowly too. He has no need of the wise and powerful only the humble and lowly. He says, untie this donkey and bring it here. The Lord has need of it. Only in the Lord's possession, being brought to him, is the cult able to serve its purpose. But it must be brought. And as we gather and we bring others before the Lord, we are empowering them for their intended purpose, placing them in the hands of the Lord. Some may seek to stop you asking, why are you untying that colt? Our response, the Lord has need of it. What can be more exalting and honoring than that? I might have some of you worried that I might be stretching the text and comparing us to those who were sent to spread the good news with the colt of a donkey. But then I consider Jesus' words recorded earlier in Luke's gospel. Um, it might just help if you're doubting just to turn to chapter 13 and you can look at the passage that begins in, at verse 10. You see, Jesus had just healed a woman who had been bound by a disabling spirit on the Sabbath. 
And the ruler of the synagogue was indignant that he would do so on the Sabbath. He said, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath. But what is the Lord's answer to him? It's down in verse 15. You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? Pause for a second. We have the exact same idea going on in our text with even the same wording. This colt needs to be untied and led or brought. It's the same two Greek words, untie and bring it to me. Now listen to Jesus' words. He continues, And ought not this woman, he's comparing her to the donkey, ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who had been bound by Satan for 18 years, ought she not be, ought to be untied and loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? We could go into much greater detail regarding the owners. And then the cloaks that are cast upon the colt, those that are spread, the garments spread upon the way. I'm afraid I'd probably lose most of you on that. So perhaps in a classroom setting, we could pursue that. Let me simplify it this way. When you and I carry the gospel message which Chase shared with us earlier, into the village that is before us. People are indeed loosed from their sins. Amen. And they are brought to the sin bearer. And Jesus is exalted in them as they finally live out the purpose for which they were created. To carry the king before the multitudes and every facet of their lives. But note, as the colt carries the king, it's not the colt that is praised. Know your place. You who are highly favored, exalted to partake in such a work, the colt is in praise, but rather the king who called for him to be untied and brought into his presence. He is the one who is praised. And praise him, the multi multitudes must. They will not be silenced by the religious experts. The praise will not be supplanted with the praise of stones. They are the stones. They're living stones, Peter writes, being fitted and fashioned into the spiritual house that the son of David would build, built upon the precious and rejected cornerstone. In our reading earlier this week, going through 1 Kings, reading about the building of Solomon's temple, we saw that the stones had to be quarried off-site so that the noise and the debris would not pollute the temple site. You and I, right now, are being quarried off-site. From the outside, the onlooker would see only the rough stone, but from the inside, it was overlaid with the finest of cedar and that with pure gold, fitted into a beautiful hold for God's glory to dwell. That's the portrait of what's taking place with you and me. Jesus didn't ride into Jerusalem on a coat, colt to assume kingship. He rode to announce it, fulfilling both the expected and the unexpected. And this beast of burden has the privilege of carrying the king, burdened with the sins of the world. This cult bears up the Lord of all the earth who will bear our sin and shame. This untied cult carries the one who will carry his own cross up Calvary's hill to be bound to it with nails iron nails as he pays for the sins of you and me. Just as no one has ever sat on this colt, 
for it was appointed for Jesus. In five days, Jesus will be laid in a tomb, cut in the stone, in which no one has ever yet been laid. Same wording. A tomb that belonged to another. A tomb, ultimately, it should have been yours and mine. No. This beast of burden, no one has ever sat upon. Only our Lord Jesus. And it's him we praise. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son and that he was obedient to you unto death, even death on a cross. That he humbled himself far more than what we even looked at this morning. Your, your original plan far exceeds anything we could have fashioned. It's far more glorious. I ask that you open our eyes that we would see that glory, that we would know that your son has come to seek and save the lost. One of the stories we passed over when we were looking at the context right before Jesus' triumphal entry that's what Jesus announced to Zacchaeus, who was low in stature. Oh, he had great wealth, but he was small in his own eyes. We find that it wasn't Jesus who climbed, it wasn't Zacchaeus who climbed a tree to find Jesus. It was your son who climbed up on a tree to find us. We thank you that you have found us. That we were once lost, but now found. Thank you, Jesus, for being rejected in our place, for being rejected for us. Thank you for coming in the most unexpected way. We can't help but love you. Amen. And now.